Hi everyone, this is Howard. Welcome back to another Star Talk Tuesday. This Tuesday being the 5th of May, 2020. Uh, <clears throat> looking forward this week astronomically, uh, the, the obvious highlight this week, of course, on May 7th is the supermoon. Uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with this term, what makes the moon super is, well, it's a su it is a full moon. But what makes it super is that it occurs when the moon is at a position known as perigee. Let me define this really quickly. In very simple terms, if you imagine the moon orbiting around the Earth, if the Earth were at the very center of the moon's orbit, well, then the moon would be equidistant from the Earth at every single position in its orbit. If the Earth is at the very center, that makes logical sense. Well, that's not where the Earth is, actually. It's a little bit off-center, and so as a necessity to this, the moon will be closer to the Earth in some part of its orbit and further away in others. And when that lineup, when that occurs, when we have a full moon and the moon happens to be closest to the Earth, then you get a full moon. And what that leads to is something in the sky that looks pretty similar to what you may have already seen anyway, is a full moon, but it, because it's a little bit closer, there are two things that are happening. It is a little bit bigger and it is brighter. Now, when it's bigger, by being bigger, it's only marginally bigger, and I'm willing to bet that most people looking at it would not even notice that it is bigger. What they will notice is that it is brighter, and that is the real sort of quality that it adds as a supermoon. Now, uh, there are other things this week uh, that are worth mentioning, and, uh, and of course, looking forward, uh, uh, there are some interesting uh, tools I want to introduce people to, but I want to show you uh, the reason why I want to, looking forward, use this new tool is uh, regarding to something that was seen in the sky in the recent past. In fact, that's why if you look, you'll see down here the date is set to April 30th. This was just last week. And uh, keen-eyed Florida observers noticed in the sky at night some objects moving through the sky, and I'm going to show you what they saw. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and accelerate the clock here. I'm going to be very careful because I don't want to go too fast like I typically do. And of course you'll notice something that we, we're doing, something we don't typically do, which is we're looking to the north. So as we look to the north, we see the sky setting on the other side of the sky, and I've got to pay very close attention at this part so I don't mess this up. I'm going to zoom in here into the north. As we get here, ooh, there we go, we're getting really close. So as we look here, you can see I've put on uh, satellite labels. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this clock a little bit faster forward so we can watch time tick by. And you can see uh, what's visible to the naked eye as you look up into the sky is that you'll notice uh, satellites, little points of light moving through the sky. And, and those are part of the communication arrays. Excuse me. Ooh, they disappeared on me for a moment. I'm just lining us up here. Because when we look here in a moment, here they come. There's the first of what's known as the uh, Starlink satellite system that's been recently uh, launched into space via SpaceX. And let's bring this back to a slower speed here. And what you're watching, the labels kind of reveal uh, their, 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 de their designators, but this is the, uh, the train of satellites that's been launched into space by SpaceX. And what they're hoping to do, what we've got so far, is they've launched about 420 satellites into space. What they project to do is, when they're finished, is to have about 12,000 satellites in space. And what they're trying to do is create what's known as a satellite constellation, uh, where they blanket the Earth and these satellites, and they deliver broadband internet service to, to the most remote regions on planet Earth, all over planet Earth, expanding communication all over the planet. There's nowhere on planet Earth when this is complete that you won't have internet service. Now, they, they did initially create some uh, furor because well, here are these things now that are visible because they reflect light of the sun, and you'll notice this happens only at sunrise and sunset. We're not too far from sunset. So these Starlink satellites, and we'll take this in a little bit closer so you can kind of see what's happening here. It's like watching a train move through the sky, or rather, like a parade. Uh, and so what we see here, those lead elements, there's 1322, um, like a train moving out in through the sky. And what they're eventually going to do is move into a position in orbit about 350 miles away from the orbit of the Earth, uh, and they will eventually provide the service that they're intended to. Now, uh, the, the, the light and the distraction that they may potentially create and that astronomers got very upset about, um, uh, SpaceX has addressed that, and uh, their answer is to create, the, well, all future satellites will be going up what they call, they're calling them VisorSat, which uh, simply is a little shield that sits around the, 
the satellite itself that blocks the light from reflected off of the Earth. It's all reflected light from the Earth that reflects off the antenna and makes them visible like this. So the future satellites won't have those and we won't be able to notice them. Uh, but right now we can see these satellites as they move into position and so they're constantly moving in these orbits around the Earth and there's an interesting website called, uh, let me see, it's called, I can't believe I can't, I forgot its name, it's called uh, Satflare, that's what it is, excuse me, Sla Satflare. Uh, and you can click on the uh, Starlink uh, link there that I can't stop clicking objects. There we go. Uh, that will um, show you when you enter the link or enter the location where you are on planet Earth. It'll tell you when to look to see these things. And so uh, I didn't. I tried to show you one for next week, but unfortunately the forecast isn't far enough ahead that I could actually give one that's practical, and they didn't show up in time. So I went back to the past to just show you the thing that made the news recently. And so as you can see, this happened at right around 8:52. Oops, we lost them. There they go. They just came out of here out of the northwestern horizon and they're trekking across the sky like a train. And there's 1322. It was the lead element that we saw and there it is getting ready to start sinking down in the west and of course then you can see that absolute uh, uh, just huge arrangement of satellites visible out there in the sky. Those are all um, communication satellites that are really far out in space. But as you can see, as we look, you'll see Starlink passing through the view. And as we transition to a different part, what you'll see are segments where great big parts of the train are going by and lots of satellites pass through the view. Now, they will eventually, whoops, I get too far away, they s disappear. They'll eventually move through the sky and then arc into the horizon and disappear. And they only they make the whole passage in about uh, roughly about nine ten minutes. Th not every pass takes that long. Some of them are very short and they don't go over above the horizon. So if you're curious to see one of these things and track them and know when to look and see them, uh, especially if you've got kids, this can look absolutely phenomenal in the sky. Um, I recommend using uh, Satflare.com or uh, I believe it is called FindStarlink.com. And if you punch in your your latitude and longitude, uh, it will, uh, and then you click predict, it will tell you when upcoming passes will be and show you where to look in the sky. Now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn off these satellite labels, and I'm going to now return us, well, we're going to go forward in time, we're going to go back to, well, here it is tonight, this is Tuesday, and I'm going to move this forward now. So now I'm going to take you to May 11th, almost the end of the week. And now this is 9 o'clock in the evening, and we're looking to the east. I'm going to pull this out a little bit. This is 9 o'clock in the evening, and we're looking into the east. And I'm going to go ahead and just accelerate the clock, because we want to get to the latter part of the evening here to show you something fascinating going on in our sky. Now here we see the constellations rising. We'll put up their artwork so you can see this happening. Here they come. I want to get them positioned enough. So here come the planets. But you can see the moon slowly shifting eastward. Let's go ahead and we'll stop that right at 5 o'clock in the morning. We'll make that a, a nice, sensible hour. There we go. And that's quarter to 5. That's good enough. We're going to get rid of the artwork here in a moment. But just to give you a sense of where all those constellations lie in the sky, we're now looking to the south. And so, um, sadly, those fascinating objects have taken up what is a an awkward position in the sky behind the centaur. Uh, what we see is a, a beautiful grouping of the Moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. And now those are part of the things that I want everyone to notice, but there's something else going on in the sky, so I'm going to jump ahead. We're going to ignore Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon for a moment, if, if that's even possible. Let me get rid of the artwork. And, oh, actually, let's turn that back on for just a moment so I can show you where it is. Let's look up here. And in this part of the sky where we see Altair, the, or excuse me, uh, Aquila the Eagle, Cygnus the swan, and there's the lyre, or Lyra, the harp. Uh, the, the bright stars that we see here as we kind of bring it in, we'll get Deneb up there. Yep, then Deneb popped up. So Vega, Deneb, and Altair make up what's known as the Summer Triangle, a very prominent object in the sky. So right here, nestled in between those three, 
are two different constellations. If you didn't realize, there's a fox, that's Vulpecula. And right here is a little arrow. That's called Sagitta. And that is, of course, that's Latin for arrow. And if you see the connection, of course, here's Sagittarius, the, the centaur. But Sagittarius means he is the archer. And you can make that connection. Sag Sagitta is the arrow. So this particular constellation is a tiny one, right in between the beak of the eagle and the, f the paws of Vulpecula. But as we zoom in, and I'm going to get rid of the artwork at this point. So right there, those stars, if you see right there, it's right there in the fletching where the feather is. I'm going to get rid of the artwork. And as we bring this in closer, there it is, Pallas. Now, Pallas, if you haven't heard of Pallas, well, Pallas is one of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt. And there was a time when Pallas was thought it was thought to be a planet. That name doesn't ring a bell. Pallas is sort of an AKA for Athena. So this was following the Greco-Roman tradition. Pallas was just another name for Athena because they thought what they were looking at was a planet. And what they were really looking at was one of the largest asteroids in the belt. And Pallas happens to be passing by, well, a, a few relatively bright stars. And I, I like to compare like this because finding an asteroid like this is not very easy. And even once you've found it, it's like, it's like looking at a sky full of crows and saying, hey, look at that one, scrow, that one crow right there. And, and you're saying, there's hundreds of crows up there. Which one are you talking about? And if they were just sort of scattered across the sky, you, that would be very hard to point one out. But if the sky is full of crows, and you say, which one are you talking about? And the one I want you to see happens to be sitting on a, on a stop sign. It would be ideal for me to say, hey, look at the stop sign. And you'll see the crow that I'm talking about. And in this case, the crow is Pallas, the asteroid. And the stop sign is that star right there, Sham, which is part of Sagitta. It's a relatively bright star. And you can see that with the naked eye. Uh, but with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to get a tighter field of view. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I've never looked at Pallas, so I can't give you a, a sense of visually what this might look like. I'm really curious. I, you, I promise you this. I will be out uh, some night with my telescope uh, on a particular this day, hopefully on this day, uh, to try to sneak a peek of that. And as we zoom in, there's Pallas. And it, ooh, I'm going to pause it because time's going by really quickly there. You can zoom in, and we actually can get to the point where you actually see this rocky-looking meatball. There's Pallas. Uh, at one time, a planet. Very short-lived life as a planet in our solar system. Now, we're going to pull out, pull the view out farther and farther. We'll let time tick by again. And as we go back out, we're going to wrap this up by looking at this beautiful arrangement. Look at how far we had to pull out. There we go. There's the there's Sagitta. There's the arrow. There's the fletching. There's a little palace, and there's Sham. What a great or terrible name for a star, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Uh, all right. Well, this is no sham down here. This is a this is a true beautiful uh, thing to catch in the sky. What we've got is this chance sort of uh, arrangement. Uh, I, you know, I, I I'm fond of using the description of the planetarium. It's kind of like walking into a diner and seeing Marilyn Monroe, James Dean, and Humphrey Bogart sitting there. Uh, instead, what we've got is. Uh, uh, we've got the moon, we've got Jupiter, and we've got Saturn in a relatively tight view. And on this particular morning, uh, we've got the moon joining the party. Uh, it won't be there tomorrow. It'll shift over this way further to the east, drifting between Saturn and way over here. There's Mars popping into the view out of the bottom left. So the moon will go somewhere from here uh, to somewhere right about here uh, the following day. Uh, so naked eye observers, as you come up in the morning, you could clearly see this beautiful trio of very bright objects, but the moon itself will likely be very bright. Uh, but these two are relatively bright themselves, and so I think you'll be able to get a nice naked eye arrangement of that in the sky. Anyway, I think I've run out of time. I know I'm in trouble when my mouth hurts. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining us. This has been our uh, Star Talk Tuesday. Uh, we'll catch you again real soon. Thanks again for joining us, folks.